Uh, this is actually the second time we've spoken at uh, WebForms Fair. We did a joint meetup several years ago, so it's good to be back. Um, as Sergey mentioned, I actually am the organizer of the MySQL meetup group. Um, I'll watch in a second. Um, so tonight's talk is very simple. I want to help all of the people that are focused on front-end design and you know the steps of improving performance in front-end design. And I want to show you how easy it is to apply the same techniques and principles to your application and the data paths that you have to accessing your back-end systems. So I know some of you will not be uh, application developers or DBAs or architects, but some of you do cross over and you do both schools. So uh, hopefully out of this you'll get some good techniques uh, and or you'll be able to go back to your colleagues and say, okay, this is something we need to look at doing to improve performance of the entire system. Uh, and this presentation, while I have a background in MySQL, I know a little about a lot of things. Um, a number of these techniques are applicable independently of how you access your data. And I'll go through several examples of no SQL or just generic SQL type improvements that you can make. So again, if you're not using MySQL, if you're say a MongoDB shop, uh, you can actually apply the same principles. Um, as I mentioned, I run the New York MySQL Meetup Group. We're actually meeting in this location uh, next month as well. Um, uh, uh, Peter Zaitsev, the CTO, CEO of Pocono, will be speaking. I've worked with databases for a number of years. I've been uh, focused in the MySQL space. Uh, I'm an author of four books and I do quite a lot of uh, speaking and presenting. So what is web performance? Um, I did a little bit of a Google search and I uh, sort of found a few sites and I came up with five areas that I feel are um, generically described for web performance. And hopefully here who are people who are uh, front end people, these things make sense to them. Gzipping assets, making fewer requests, adding aspiring headers, using a CDN, and optimize images, just to get you started. Anyone here think that something else should be in there when you first start doing front end performance? Okay, everyone here is an expert in those five things. Yes? Go on, Matt. JavaScript is the bottom of the page. JavaScript. Or asynchronous, asynchronous okay, that's a good that's a good point. Asynchronous loading of actions. Compile CSS. Compile? Compile CSS and JavaScript. Compile CSS? Compile CSS? Or minified CSS? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Minified CSS? Caching? Okay, these are all good things. So we'll also discuss those particular points during the talk and then we can add those to the end of all things we want to talk about. So I'll actually cover some of these things that we just talked about as well. So just to give you a background, I'm going to be jumping between terminology that you're familiar with and terminology you may be less familiar with. So I wanted to define the scope of that. So when I'm talking about web performance, I'm going to talk about the actual user, the requests that they will make, uh, and the responses that they will get and not including CDNs or other complexities, we pretty much have the internet involved and some type of web container. Whether it's Apache, Nginx, Node, a Java container. If you're gonna set up a HTTP request, you have to have something to receive the request and send back a response. It may surprise you that for uh, data access, the picture looks exactly the same. It's a web container who is actually the consumer who is then making a request to the database store and retrieving a response. So I'm going to apply the same principles in the presentation we're talking about with front end, hopefully for you to apply to accessing your data. So let's talk about the first point, which was gzipping assets. Who here does not know how to gzip assets? Anybody? No? Well then all these slides I created are, uh, <laughs> don't serve any benefit. Um, so you load the module, you add your uh, directives to that, and you just get the benefits. It's as simple as that. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, uh, mod deflate is what you want to do. And a simple example is pulling up my own website. Uh, we can look at the size of the actual uh, individual artifacts, uncompressed and compressed. Makes sense, right? And if we look at particularly the minified uh, CSS there, 
uh, we can actually see a 98% compression of just the CSS to Bootstrap. So that's the impact that gzip can actually make to your assets. It's very simple, um, and if you haven't done those types of metrics, it's actually good just to evaluate what's being compressed and what's not being compressed. You almost want to also might want to check what types of file uh, types that are adding to compression to ensure that everything that you need to is being compressed. Um, and you know, by looking at the actual headers, this is a way of verifying that you actually have compression. We all know that, right? Great. Surprise, surprise, you can do the same thing with the database with a little bit more work. The same principle applies. That is, if you have a large object that you want to store or retrieve, and it's highly compressible, then you should consider compressing the data. In my SQL terms, uh, if you have a text column, and if you store JavaScript or JSON or HTML or some other content that's uh, generally repetitive, uh, you can reap huge benefits for compression of that column. So a simple example is you look for your largest tables, you look for the columns of those tables which are of type text, and just do a look at the, link, look at the length of the column. Here's an example from a client I worked with the last few weeks, uh, and the current data, I just grabbed it from their server yesterday, because we've done some optimizations. Uh, uh, this column has 162K of data. We do a little bit more analysis, and we look at the, uh, the length, the, value, the length of what it would be if the data was compressed using the standard MySQL compression algorithm. We see an 84% improvement in data. Going a little bit further, um, there's a command in MySQL called Procedure Analyze. Who here is familiar with that? Anybody? A few of you? Great. Um, if you absolutely have no idea how to analyze your data in MySQL, this is an ability to tack that on the end of any select statement and get some metrics back about the source of the data. Now, you should caveat the information you receive it can provide some types of good information, it can provide some misleading information, particularly about the recommended data types. So I don't always suggest that you look at this and go, I'm gonna change all my data types accordingly. But if you wanna do some analysis like, are there any null columns, are there any empty columns, what are the minimum maximum lengths of your fields? This is an easy way to work that out. This also works well if you have, for example, a certain data type and you don't know what side of length that you really wanna set the field to. Uh, even just a regular data type, you can use the same syntax. And what happened here is, is I took a table uh, and it had about uh, 4 million rows in it and I simply applied this new technique of compression against that column and I was able to reduce the actual disk, op, disk uh, space of this table by 80%. So what does this mean in math? In, in a database, there's a very simple optimization that I usually uh, provide to customers, and that is you reduce the amount of disk space of data on disk, particularly hot data. That means you can put more data in memory, therefore you get greater performance. It's very simple, it's not complicated. So thinking about this technique can improve that one type of access. However, the benefits are actually magnified. The size of your backup, the size of data written to disk to be able to replicate to slaves. These are all things that are affected by optimizing the data that you write to the database. Um, however, the approach of doing this is to, you can compress the data as you're inserting it into the table, updating it, or retrieving it. You can use MySQL functions around the columns. But really that's too late for optimally using this type of compression. You should let the application do this work for you. And if the application does the work, then you actually reap the benefits of not just what's stored on disk for the database, but also what is transported across the network and within MySQL replication. So what happens is if you do the work in the web container, you get the benefits of all the components that we talked about earlier. The request, across the network, the database itself, and the response. Whereas if we're looking at just gzip of assets, from our web perspective, that happens on the server and only the response receives reaps the benefit. Make sense? Great. 
So the next thing is sprites. Who here is familiar with creating sprites? Who here wants to name the best site to build sprites? Anybody? Come on. Sprite me. Great. Look, a system administrator beat all you tech guys. Front end guys. What is this? You just got a job. Um, so what's the, what, what way are sprites important? The number one reason is, is that it's all about making requests. And those requests involve a network connection. And they take time. So uh, with HTTP 1.1 and with browsers, you can maintain persistent connections, but there's a certain limitation based on the browser, whether it's two, four, or six, number of concurrent connections to an individual host. So if you don't have sprites and you use the Sprite Me website to just actually look, it's a good demonstration of, here's an example of what's not with sprites. I don't know if they actually have a page of, here's the optimization. Um, but without sprites, you load assets, and then the second lot of assets you can see down there are actually being blocked because they're not being loaded because there's only a certain number of persistent connections that can happen concurrently against a single DNS lookup. The same approach can be applied to accessing your data. And I'll start with a very simple NoSQL access example. This is a customer from a couple of years ago. On their PHP page, they connect to Memcache, which is a caching tier, non-persistent caching tier. And in one page lookup, they were doing 28 requests to Memcache. That may not sound like a lot. And if you have a really fast network, it may not appear like a lot. But if, like many of you, uh, probably working on a public cloud, network latency can be a highly undesirable impact in a lot of requests for your web pages. So over tests on this cloud, we were looking at anywhere up to 50 milliseconds to retrieve that data. So they were doing 28 separate memcache gets in their code. Now, if you combine all that into one single multi-get statement, so that's one network round trip, then you've got somewhere on average of five or six milliseconds. So we're talking a 10x improvement in performance on one page. And for those who work in uh, high volume websites, particularly on clouds where the network can be a little unpredictable, this is removing the potential uh, increase in latency that you may see. Make sense? The same approach can be applied to MySQL or just even general SQL statements. Uh, however, I will put a caveat, this is MySQL specific syntax for inserts. Uh, if you've ever seen this example where you do multiple insert statements inside a transaction, anyone ever seen this before? Okay, some people have, great, shouldn't do it. Um, and the reason why is, is that in MySQL you can actually combine all those valued clauses in one statement. So what this means is one network round trip not five round trips. Again, improving performance. You get added benefits here because MySQL is more complex. Every SQL statement has to be parsed. It has to be checked to see if you have security. It has to be checked whether there's a type of cache and validation has to happen. Um, what actually does the work? So there's even additional overhead per SQL statement. Again, in a well-tuned system, these are really efficient. This is like 0.1 of a millisecond or even faster. But again, it's actually the network round trip that takes the majority of the time. Uh, I have an article from several years ago, it looks like six years ago, uh, where I provide an example of just how much improvement you can actually get as a reference there. Um, these slides will be available tonight on the website, so don't be concerned if you miss something, if I'm going too fast. Um, uh, you'll be able to look at them at your leisure. When it comes to working with a database, there is one simple technique that will improve performance. And that is to reduce, consolidate, or even remove SQL statements. Now this may seem a little foreign to you, but there's a practice for seasoned professionals about tuning SQL statements. And I want to share this pearl of wisdom. Someone comes to me and says, I have this SQL statement, can you help me tune it? My first response to them is, do you actually need to run this SQL statement? And that may sound a little bit funny because you're going to go, of course we do. Uh, well, actually, you'll find that in many situations, it's not, not actually true. And, and there are various times when I've looked at code paths, and I can just simply eliminate the actual statement completely, or I can consolidate it, just because over time, things have become suboptimal. 
or something's being retrieved, it's not actually being used by that web page itself. There are other types of patterns that you see. There's a classic problem called n plus one problem, where you see a repeating iteration of SQL statements. Generally, you've retrieved a set of data and then you iterate over that set of data to retrieve more data. This is a common problem, uh, as someone in the back is having his own private joke uh, about it, is this is a classic problem when the developer does not understand set theory or relational algebra, which are the concepts behind relational databases. And in a nutshell, for lack of a better term, that is how to use joins. So the people that will do joins in code because they want to uh, simplify how they program things. And I have this term that I use, and there are several articles on the next slide, where I talk about row at a time processing versus chunk at a time processing. This is your procedural way of thinking about processing a set of data versus this is the way you think about it when you can work on a set of data with a simple, op a simple operator. There are many examples and these blog posts go into those details. I don't want to bore you with a lot of examples tonight. You can go back and look at those particular things. But here's a really good one. This is WordPress. So WordPress selects the options that it wants to load then goes and gets the information from the options table for each individual option. Classic example of iterating over a set of responses because I don't know how to do a join. And I heard Drupal mentioned, uh, probably not in vain, but all those people around here that use Drupal, Drupal is really bad. Um, so um, I, I'll give you a little tip later on uh, how to identify those. Uh, and then also my contact details for professional consulting. WordPress uh, is awesome, right? WordPress is awesome. WordPress is a popular CMS product, much like Drupal and many other products that are out there. Uh, Joomla, Magento, uh, all, a whole range of those things. Unfortunately, many of those products were never designed by seasoned architects, and they get added on and added on and added on, and they suffer from these types of uh, problems, and they want to maintain a great level of compatibility, and they just don't let old habits die. Um, so this type of thing doesn't work really well with when you have a high performance system. So another related topic in regarding to making fewer HTTP requests, I didn't give it a top level star, but it's, it's, so, it's, it's also related is doing a DNS lookup. So we talked about persistent connections. Uh, you can, for example, spread them across multiple DNS hosts, but DNS lookups also suffer from an actual TCP request which is a multi-part handshake to gather information. Um, it creates a level of latency, and it also provides some issues of blocking several requests. So this is another thing you can look at optimizing in the web world. Translating that to what does that mean in database speak? Well, get one single database connection rather than multiple database connections in a page. Only get the connection if you need it. I've worked on sites where the home page will get a database connection, hold it for the creation of the page, then release it, and they've done no work against the database. Well, they've made a connection, that took a network round trip, they've taken a resource that takes time to process uh, for no benefits. Frameworks are generally the culprits here. Another thing that's important is you only open it when you need to get it, and you close it when you're done. Uh, and uh, scaling out reads and writes, which again is a concept we need to think about. Transactions is another thing that's foreign to people who here does not know what a transaction is. Don't be afraid. I will quiz you if you don't put your hand up. All right. These people do not know what transactions are. Everyone else does, right? Okay. All right. Everyone seems to be keen that they can answer the question what a transaction is. Who here does not use transactions in their code, but know that transactions exist? All right. Who here uses Drupal and doesn't have it configured to use transactions? <laughs> <laughs> Who here uses WordPress? Doesn't use transactions. Okay, it might scare you. Um, transactions is a mean of grouping work together. There's a concept called ACID. You should go read it, not actually uh, take the concept expressively and go use it. Uh, you should understand what ACID actually means. Um, and one of the things that's important about transactions is, is that it's an all or nothing approach. So you actually get a benefit if you're doing multiple operations uh, and a performance improvement in terms of the management of the data. Um, 
as a side thing, you actually get a whole less error handling you need to manage uh, if you've never thought about this. The flip side of that is I've seen people go overboard with transactions and they're creating a new registration of an order and rather than doing it in one transaction, they have to do three separate transactions. One to like process the order, then one to like create the email queue and then one to do something else. This is also an abuse of the process where, you know, if the first step works, which means they created the order, second step of creating the email queue to send out, hey, we received your order, you, you've got this. If that fails, then you have the order, but you don't have the notification. So again, a similar concept of all or nothing. So if you're not familiar with uh, how your connections are working in the database, like are you getting multiple connections each time that you're actually connecting on a page, uh, or you're not using transactions, these are two things you need to look at. And I will, in a slide somewhere soon, I don't know where I put it, uh, talk about, oh, here it is actually right now, I was right. Um, in MySQL, there are very simple techniques of looking at what you want to do. Uh, in a non-production environment, you should always enable the general query log. So for development environments, even potentially test environments, you should have this enabled. Which can be kind of scary, but it actually shows you what work happens in the database. Um, now before MySQL 5.6, this was pretty much the only non-intrusive way to get a sequential list of statements per database connection. So therefore you could look at what happens on a page. MySQL 5.6 is a little thing called a performance schema, and you can just run an SQL statement. So uh, anybody here who's an administrator, this is one of the five top reasons to move to using MySQL 5.6, which is already at least two and a half years old from production to get. Yes? Sure. So the question was about using uh, MySQL stored procedures. So if you come from a, let me guess, SQL Server background? Um, no? Maybe Infomax background? Postgres? Okay. You know, generally if I actually look at someone's code, I can kind of tell what their history is. Um, you know, particularly like, you know, procedures calling procedures or views on top of views or other types of things. So the question was, do you uh, what are the benefits of stored procedures? So you can encapsulate multiple statements. Let's say, for example, an insert into an order or insert into order items, uh, you know, update uh, payment details. You can pass all those to the database in one call to a stored procedure, which begins the transaction, does a number of inserts, updates, it commits and returns that response. So this is another way to encapsulate all of those statements in one database round trip. So immediately there's a performance benefit of doing that. There are, however, several limitations in MySQL with stored procedures. One of them is you can't easily pass in arrays or dynamic um, argument parameters. So it has a few limitations there. Earlier versions didn't have appropriate error handling, but they've got better in that. Um, overall, it can be a good thing. The de another downside is you don't get the monitoring out like these two options to actually look at what SQL statements are actually running in the database in MySQL unless you get to 5.7. So there are benefits, absolutely, um, and it can improve performance and can encapsulate work in the database so you're not relying on a developer to make changes um, to important. I thought I had an example of the general log there I must have missed putting up there. Um, but the general log is really important because you actually get to see the connections that are made and the actual SQL statements that are being executed. And this is really good to kind of scare developers uh, when they're creating code to actually like, here are the SQL statements, you're running 10 SQL statements, you're running 20 SQL statements. Oh my, you're running 156 SQL statements. Um, you may laugh, but that was an example where someone changed some code uh, in some sort of, you know, homegrown framework and they change the most critical path which happens you know tens of thousands of times a minute um, from doing I think nine SQL statements to 156 or because they did something in a wrong loop and it went away and got some meaningless data it didn't need. So you need to see that and then when your developers get a little bit more experienced you talk to them about the query execution plan which is this fabulous thing to describe what SQL statement does particularly if you decide to modify it did it make it better or worse? Developers don't need to know how to read the execution plan. They need to know how to find the, the red flag to go, I may need some help before I commit this code. Because you know, DBAs and administrators and ops teams, the worst thing that they like is the code is fine, it gets deployed at 3 a.m. in the morning and they get paid because the system goes down. It happens all the time. And you know, as uh, someone who's uh, recently built out an operations team, 
you know, the simple solution to that is, okay, well, I, you know, uh, did you deploy any code? Yes, well then roll back the code. Um, you know, I don't want to get paid. So um, letting the developers see this earlier, you get to find all these tricks, like how many connections do they run? Are they running extra SQL statements? Um, and uh, some slides that I have at the end will list a couple of presentations, and I go into this in a lot more detail. Expiry headers. Does so anyone want to explain what that does for web performance? Anybody? Yes? It tells the browsers, don't bother getting more data until this time. Don't Excellent. bother getting this resource until this time. Don't get this resource because I hold it locally. Therefore, I don't need to do a network round trip or a blocking request to get the information. So get the browser, get the content just from the browser. Um, and if you're not really familiar about particular things, there are several things I just randomly picked a uh, website, um, GT Matrix, that gives you a little bit more information about headers. The database, same concept, which is I'm the consumer in a web that means the user and their browser before they connect to the network. Okay, before they make a request. Same thing here, now we have the application that's cache information rather than making a request across the network. And there are several stages of caching. The first one is rather than getting the data from the database, we can actually get it from a cache itself. So is that cache a persistent or non-persistent cache? These are important characteristics. Persistence is something like a Redis append only mode. Uh, Non-persistence is like a memcache, for example. Is it local on the server that you're connecting or is it connected to a distributed? This is important because local is no network round trip where distributed is a network round trip and I'll discuss this in a little bit more detail later. Um, and you just want to actually get data more efficiently so you can have less overheads of what you want to do. Um, one of the biggest disadvantages about using caches which you would probably also experience in either browser caches or server side caches for web, app, web assets is how does it get invalidated? Who here has had CDNs that won't invalidate content? Yes, okay, so only one user experiences the problem, which happens to be a C-level executive of your company, um, where they're, they're not being invalidated. Same problem exists when dealing with data in a database. And generally, you have to consider the concept of, do I invalidate the cache as I'm writing the data through to the database, or am I, when I'm retrieving the data back or writing the data back afterwards, am I invalidating it? So these are important characteristics to think about. As I mentioned, uh, popular products that you see, Memcache and Redis, they have their advantages and they have their disadvantages. There are many other types of products that you can look at. In MySQL, there are actually some caches that people don't realize that are there that can serve a benefit. MySQL has a concept called the MySQL query cache that actually sits on the database but will detect if the content that you're asking for has already been retrieved and simply just retrieved a pre-cooked value of that. And it's significantly uh, improved. Um, you can actually trace down into MySQL and when a general statement might take 20 or 30 steps from the database, this only takes four. So they're significantly faster. Um, PHP, for example, the MySQL ND, the native driver, which is pretty consistent across MySQL these days, uh, that actually has the capability of actually doing caching as well. So another thing to consider is MySQL has a NoSQL option of accessing data. So you don't have to go select value from table where ID equals X. Uh, you can actually use a memcache protocol call to actually do a get directly to retrieving that data. Who here has heard of this before? A few, so most of you haven't. Who here uses MySQL and goes, oh, this might make life easier? That's good. Um, I have some other presentations of graphs. So you can get like a 4X improvement in accessing data if you're doing a lot of like key value lookups. Um, you can also provide breaking cup data with different servers. I'm oh, sorry? Does it also provide uh, breaking data with different uh, nodes? You mean like sharding the data out? No, this is for retrieving the data. Yeah, this is for retrieving the data. So it's actually going to retrieve it from MySQL without having to go through the SQL layer. Uh, and there is also another advanced option where you can actually cache data in MySQL in front of the actual data itself. So it has two types of capabilities. Um, but it's something to consider if you're doing a lot of key lookups and storing the data in MySQL, you may find that this actually improves access because you're removing the, um, 
actual database over here. Um, Does it work like, with com composite keys? Um, I believe it only just works with a single key lookup, so you've got to have an ID, but you can retrieve multiple columns from the same table. Uh, initially, the first version was a little um, uh, uh, incomplete because Memcache only works with strings, so you couldn't actually even get like an, uh, a table where there was an ID in, you know, or increment column, but you can actually do that now. Um, and I can also point you later to some references uh, and some slides that I have that actually show the percentage improvements that you can get for that type of access. So uh, another question. Yes. Uh, you also mentioned memcache, but memcache has a limit on the size of the object you put there. It's not always like, uh, whatever you put just combines, it actually is a, it's a problem. Um, I've put like a megabyte of data in memcache, what's the like limit? One megabyte of okay. Sure. Um, well, every product has a limit, so um, another, you know, very generic concept is maximize the strengths of the product and minimize its weaknesses. I mean, getting and putting session data in MySQL where that's 90% of your traffic and they're big one megabyte volumes, uh, not good for MySQL. Uh, good for something else, such as a key value store. But you might have a particular limit and you might have to look at different products that can do what you need. Um, CDN is another type of caching and I want to go in a little more detail here. Um, so the concept of uh, expired headers is don't make a network round trip to get your data. And there are some approaches we can look at doing that uh, with the database. CDNs are about, I want to get data, but I have it cached geographically closer. And for lack of a better term, geographically closer means closer uh, as in the distance the speed of light has to travel to retrieve your data. It's simply based on um, physics. Um, another benefit of CDNs is, is that you can uh, distribute the load better, you can handle spikes better, um, you can also you know, look at particular types of WAN optimization to distribute your information better, um, all reducing the performance impact of a request, therefore making the overall experience faster, therefore giving you greater performance, uh, or the perception to the user that the system is more performant. So when it comes to working with a database, uh, there are several things we can look at doing. We can, as we talked about before, look at levels of caching. We can look at actually putting a, uh, I think I have a slide a bit later. Um, we can look at removing calls, uh, reducing load improving performance. Um, but uh, another thing to consider is what type of caching you want to do. And here's an example of a database path that I'm talking about work with a customer that has a number of store locations and they would just select the store locations from the database um, and paint them on the page where people could choose what store they wanted to go to to purchase the product. Now, that's a select from the database which was efficient when using the query cache, but the next logical step for the developers was to put that into mem cache because then what happens is they're making a more efficient call in theory However, if your system is really performant, then I use the concept of robbing Peter to pay Paul is, again, the network overhead is the most expensive amount of time in the actual operation. So if you're getting it from Memcache or you're getting it from the database, it doesn't make any difference because they both basically take about the same amount of time. If it's five milliseconds and then 0 0.1 millisecond to retrieve the data, then all the impact is in the network. So this is an example of taking data and not storing it on, in the database, not storing in the cache, but actually creating a file and writing it to the file system of the server so that therefore we can actually access that file directly. It's closer to, a, in hindsight, it's closer to the expires headers concept where the consumer, in this case the web server, doesn't have to do a network round trip to get the information, it's actually on the file system rather than getting it from cache, rather than getting it from the database. And you can write an administration process that will, if you change the data, recreate this file, for example. Yeah. Yes? Would um, the equivalent of something like that be using the local database instead of an yes. so instead of on a separate server? Yeah, so an extension of this, which I was about to mention, um, thanks for bringing it up, was you use memcache and you have memcache in a distributed environment, you have a number of memcache servers, well, maybe you consider having a local memcache server that's attached to each of your web servers. 
If you run 10, 20, 30 web servers, you may want to create a local cache. However, then you have a caching validation problem. And um, PHP has APC, is that right? There's uh, another thing like in-memory process where you can keep versions of data. So there are other techniques of keeping a copy of the data locally. So we're all here about talking about like reducing that network round trip, that expires headers concept. I don't have to get the data. I have a copy of it locally, whether it's in the file system, whether it's an APC, whether it's a local mem cache, as opposed to just from a generic caching uh, or data tier. So it forces you to think a little bit about what data do I have in the system and what's important. And you don't realize the, the, the impact of this until you look at every SQL statement that you're running. And there'll be many people here that'll just like, if you look at one page, you look at all the calls, look at the next page, look at all these calls, the next page, all these calls, multiplied by hundreds and thousands of connections, we'll soon come to the conclusion that, wow, I'm putting this data now in memcache, but I'm still making all these calls. Can I combine them into one memcache call rather than making six, eight, ten calls? Or can I actually remove it completely? Is there some way that I can effectively store that data closer to the source without having to do any network round trips? And now we get on to images. One of Sergey's favorite things nowadays, responsive images. And um, oh, sorry? And carousels. And carousels, yes. Yeah, he's a fan of the very awkward carousels that won't load the first image properly and then block the rest of the page load. Why aren't carousels at the bottom of the page? You know, why don't you load the content, put the carousel down the bottom, and when you're done, move the carousel off the top? Wouldn't that be like a really awkward experience too? Um, so there are different types of uh, image compression that you can use. Uh, there's responsive images, um, or there are like images depending on the size of the uh, canvas that you have. I know I talked about that sometime previously. Why do we do this? Surprise, it's the same thing as everything else we talked about. It's about reducing the network overhead, which is still the slowest portion of time in a well-tuned system. So uh, that is one thing. The other thing is particularly in terms of like disk uh, or network traffic if you're paying for bandwidth, for example. Um, who here is familiar with Compressor.io? A few of you. If you haven't used this cool tool, it's really cool. You just simply give it a file, and it gives you the compressed version of the file. Um, and you would be surprised how many images you can optimize by just dumping them in here. And they have a very interesting graphic to show. Tell me the difference, you know, of the, uh, is it a chameleon or a Komodo dragon, potentially? Uh, can you tell the difference of the animal between the original version and the compressed version? Same thing happens in the database. And the number one thing I'll look at when I'm looking at applications is, are you using ORM, uh, an object relational model, which generally does a lot of joins and gets a lot of information? Okay, this is getting a lot of data which you don't need. Uh, you can do a lazy instantiation. Or if I see select star from table, red flag. I mean, I need to see one, that one is enough of an indicator to tell me that this is likely going to happen more than once. And select star is selecting all the data where really I need a subset of the data. So it's like, I want to get the image, but I only need a certain amount of in image to provide a reasonable representation. So this is an easy way for me to find when you're um, being inefficient. What does this really mean? Select star means I want to get all the data. This makes it very difficult to maintain your code because over time, columns get added, columns get removed. You don't now know now what the code needs. So it's very difficult for people who want to like clean up uh, legacy code. What can I remove? I don't know what to remove because I don't know whether the code uses it. I've got to step through all the code to find out whether I'm using column X, which I no longer use. So by selecting the columns is better. Now, I'm not going to go into the specific reasons in the MySQL world, but internally, uh, there is a significant benefit of not using select star, particularly if your tables have those text or blob columns. You just have to believe me, or read one of my books that talks about it. So, uh, wrapping up so that we can have some Q&A time, uh, I wanted to highlight some high-level steps of how you do web performance. Now, we talked about five. Uh, there was some mentioning about caching. I think we covered caching. Uh, there was a discussion about minifying SQL. 
another uh, aspect of compression of data. So I'll add that um, to the compression area, which is a good point. Someone mentioned something else. Was caching, minifying, JavaScript, asynchronous loading of JavaScript, uh, or non-blocking operations, which Matt mentioned. So that's also another good thing. I should actually probably add an extra point. In MySQL, you can actually do the same thing. If you use PHP, for example, who here knows you can do asynchronous calls for SQL statements? You don't have to like, get the SQL statement, wait for the response, get the next SQL statement, wait for the response. You can actually say, I want to run these SQL statements, and then these are the callbacks when I get the response. So PHP can actually do that. Now, whether you've got enough to do in your PHP code while you're waiting for the response, that's a different problem. Uh, but that principle of asynchronous loading does exist. The same concept uh, is when you're doing a lot of work, whether you're doing, I want to insert, insert, do work, update, delete, you know, return, or do I want to put the work I want to do into a queue and then let a separate process handle that so that's more like asynchronous processing of your data as well. So they are both, uh, that's a good point for me to add to these slides. Um, unfortunately, you may not know it, but I only started these slides on Monday and finished them today, so um, there are some things missing. Uh, so the yes, question was, question. Um, does MySQL have parallel queries? No. Um, and flashback queries is like, look at all of the snapshot, basically, of data. So you can look at an older version of data, right? So we're looking at, yes. MySQL doesn't support either of those features. So, okay. I wanted to add another, yep. uh, another uh, asynchronous part to uh, basically how to run your page asynchronously. Well, you don't need to wait for all the data to come back to send part of the page back to the user. It's in particular, when you have lengthy queries that are, maybe you couldn't optimize that well on the SQL side, it doesn't mean your you can't show your logo on the page, right? So early flushing of the page, of the actual web page, uh, like outputting HTML early, and then waiting for the SQL result is quite useful. Well, we all uh, just expect and use AJAX calls these days, but um, who actually knows who coined the term AJAX? Anyway, it's a Google term. Yeah. Um, and I think from memory, it's about maybe mid 2000s. Um, but I can remember my first failed startup, which was in 1999. For all those people here in the room that were not even at school then, or just yeah. like, you know what computers were. We've been around for a while, the startup boom happened. Startup boom and crash happened a long time ago earlier. Uh, I can remember doing complex Ajax calls before it was called Ajax back in 1999. So talking about 16 years ago, before it even existed and was nicely encapsulated. Before then, we would load a full page, which would take a long time. Internet Explorer and Ajax. Uh, it was Internet Explorer specific, uh, like IE5, back in the days when you could actually use IE before Netscape really picked up and before you know Emacs script became sort of generic. Um, it didn't take long before the other browsers took up and IE just went the wrong way. Um, so, uh, good feedback to say there are a few more things to discuss here about like adding into the slides to build out the breadth of them. But I think hopefully what I've done is I've highlighted what techniques you use now. Yes, you have a question? Uh, yeah, um, I'm looking at your JS and you have uh, a mini Mongo with the browser that kind of sits up with the backing that uh, I'm not familiar that there's an embedded Mongo, you're saying there's an embedded Mongo in the browser now? In the client side? Basically, you're synchronizing data sets that you share whatever you want from the back end, and then it's kind of a mini. Okay, so it's like more like a persistent connection yeah. uh, management. Okay. Yeah, the idea is to reduce the uh, data going across to be like only what really matters. And the rest, all the, the assets and everything, all right, uh, client. Uh, I'm not familiar with that, but for those people who are fans of MongoDB, MongoDB suffers from a critical problem that is different to relational databases, and that is redundancy of information, or more technically, bloat. Uh, in a relational database, everything called a third normalized form, where we don't store uh, the same information in the actual collection itself. And so, you know, the technique you're talking about may be to, to reduce or strip out the overhead that is actually stored in the MongoDB collections themselves, as opposed to selecting that information from a relational database. Uh, I'm not familiar of any embedded MySQL kind of things. Um, 
So just going back, hopefully I've started with what is very familiar to you as front-end developers. And I've got you to think about how do I apply the same concept to when I'm accessing my data. And hopefully here you've learned something. Um, I want to take away with you that uh, I guarantee you, money back guarantee, um, that you can simplify, reduce, and remove access to your data. I don't care how big an organization you are, you know, I've worked with the likes of eBay and I can still reduce, simplify, and remove statements accessing the database. Um, on that note, there are a few other presentations, and I think I might add one or more to here. We talked tonight about uh, the um, memcache access, it's another slide. But uh, if you want to get a little bit more information, there's uh, the second one's about software development for MySQL. It's a presentation I did in um, Europe last year. Uh, has a lot of good information if you're a developer and you want to know how do I make things better in MySQL. And I go into more detail, for example, I talk about the general query log and how to read it and transactions, etc. Uh, common MySQL scalability mistakes is more of a high level view of how to architect and design your system uh, and these are things that you should consider and several things we've talked about tonight. Uh, and I have lots of other presentations, so many I don't even know how to count um, hundreds of them uh, at my website. Um, and if you're not convinced or you don't think it can get any better, you can of course hire me. Um, I've had people that are skeptical. Um, and in fact, the second presentation I actually gave this presentation again last week at Macona Live. Uh, customer, just to get to know, uh, believed they had a well-indexed schema. Yes, I'm sure you do. Uh, this customer had a 15 table join and it was a well-indexed schema. Uh, every table had an index. However, without changing the configuration, without changing the code, but creating better indexes, I was able to improve the system, system 17x. Um, and you can look at the slides where I saved them hundreds of thousands of dollars in hosting just by improving one query that ran 15,000 times a second. Um, and then also a recent article, uh, blog post, uh, with another customer where I got their uh, average request time on their flash sales from 2,000 milliseconds down to 45 milliseconds, um, which is an entire stack thing. It's not just MySQL related. Uh, it's caching related, it's operating system related, uh, but there are some other examples of different ways in which you can look at it from the database perspective. So, uh, unless there are any questions, uh, there are. Um, I will hold my gratitude until Sergey has something to say. So you mentioned uh, the example of keeping the data in the code, right? So it's one, basically, as local of a cache as you can get, right? No, no querying altogether. And the opposite end of the spectrum, I guess, is queries that require query every time and uh, maybe even, I mean, different levels of that. Uh, how, uh, what are the best practices for managing uh, this knowledge about the different types of queries that you have and kind of time to leave and the other properties of all of your potential data? Yeah, so um, you actually answered the question by, at the end by itself. You said time to life. And so this is the key thing. It's like, look at the statement that you're looking at, looking at the data that you're retrieving, is that data static or dynamic? You know, am I looking at the home page of Wikipedia? Um, can I cache that for a second? Of course you can. So rather than having 10,000, again, they have caches on top of caches on top of caches. Let's say you had no caching. Don't make a thousand requests for the home page of your new site or something like that. Just make one request a second and keep a copy of it. Um, you know, because you know that small change is, is not really that critical for that particular example. If you're a book versus book site, for example, hotel booking or flight booking, then it is really important that the data is up to date as soon as someone has made a booking or something. So therefore, you have to be more diligent about what data you want to do. If the data is really static and you know it doesn't change, then why retrieve it? Why even cache it? Just store it. Um, and then just invalidate those things every time there's actually a data change that's going to happen. So the time to life is the criteria. Um, determining what the time to life is, is looking at the data and see how stale is the information over time. If the answer is it doesn't change, then you can look at different levels of caching closer and closer and closer to literally the consumer, and in this example, the web container, where how do I store that? 
keeping in mind that cache invalidation is really the bane of any type of system. It's like, how do I invalidate that data? I mean, it's easy to invalidate memcache post MySQL. Um, it's, it's harder to invalidate a file on N web servers rather than one key in memcache, for example. So each caching tier has its own relative strengths and merits. I want to add that example of, of the stored locations, for example. How often does the company add stored? Right? I mean, that's a, so obvious that yes. you need to actually build buildings, sign contracts before you can add the value to that table. Right? And, and, and of the previous customer, they had four or five memcache keys that would get every single time. It's like, here are the stores, here are like the regions, here are the stores in the regions, and here, are, here is this and that and that. And I can tell you this, the data changed at best once a month. So at peak flash sale time, hundreds of thousands of memcache calls uh, to retrieve this data, and they were, as I talked before, robbing Peter, pay Paul, uh, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were putting in memcache rather than putting in what's called offload the work, but they weren't taking into consideration that the majority of the work was the network round trip. So eliminate the round trip, store it locally in some type of cache, but realize the more copies of the data that you store, the harder it is to keep it in sync. You know, uh, the question was, uh, what type of locking do you use in MySQL if you want to perform operations that, like a bank balance, del delete from one, insert for update the other, for example. So, rule number one, use transactions. Okay, rule number two, if you think you're using transactions, make sure you're using transactions and using in MySQL a transactional storage engine. This is your first requirement of data consistency, which is the C, consistency of asset. Uh, that's going to give you part of what you want to do. It's atomic, which means it's all or nothing. So, the third portion of the asset I is isolation, that's a different thing to talk about. What type of locking do you want to do? Do you want to stick with the MySQL's default locking if we're talking in ODB, the repeatable read, or if you want to do a serializable, which is another way of higher level optimistic locking, which everyone in the room except three people disclosed over, uh, which is perfectly fine. Uh, but if you want to talk in more detail, come talk to me afterwards. But MySQL has different types of locking strategies to ensure a higher level of you know, isolation, handing on types of transactions. Um, I have a couple of blog posts I can probably reference you to, um, particularly if you come from an Oracle background, which sounds like you do, um, in terms of the difference in terms of locking strategy between MySQL and Oracle. But for everyone else in the room, use transactions. Start there. Then we can optimize later, because honestly, that's the most important thing. It's like, uh, even if you have a game, even if you're, you know, giving virtual currency, if you deduct the money from someone, but then don't give them what they bought, because the second statement failed, the first statement worked, it's not in a transaction, that is lack of data integrity. Okay, that's what transactions are for. Not to mention there are lots of other good benefits, including improved performance and concurrency, which is a topic for an entire different discussion. But if there is interest in understanding those concepts, I'd be more than happy to give a presentation at my own MySQL group where you can come along and we can go through those. Who here would be interested in understanding more about the basics of transactions, how they would work, how they don't work in uh, your existing CMS product like WordPress and Drupal and everything else? How would you implement those things after the fact, for example? Yes, okay. Uh, I'll leave you with a uh, simple, I, I really love Drupal. Um, I have some very memorable quotes. In fact, the, the quotes are so good, I just question myself what's version of Drupal. The problem is, is there a version of Drupal? Did 7 really get released? Is 8 ever been released? You know, I, I just don't know. Um, are you using some modified version? Of, uh, what CMS do you use on your website? CMS. <laughs> uh, on my website, yeah, my blog, my blog's in WordPress. <laughs> Luckily, I'm not popular. I will, um, I will close with, I, I, I've been known for making comments, and this is something I say frequently, frameworks generally suck. And people sometimes laugh, particularly, I mean, I say this talk, I mean, I mentioned Drupal and the people in the audience just like laugh because they know what I'm talking about. And the people that don't know what I'm talking about, you, you and so if you feel like, that's fine. Send me a referral link. Send me traffic, you know, put some ads on your site, send the traffic. So here is my opinion of frameworks. And I will call out to my friend over there, Matt Kaplan, who educated me a few weeks ago about my perception of frameworks in this particular statement. And I should, you know, caveat this with, in brackets, legacy frameworks, because there's now these, you know, 
micro frameworks, not 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 microservices like they've got the thing on Monday night. I'm not there. We're talking like micro frameworks where you can bind things together. But here's the thing about frameworks. Here's, here's why I don't like frameworks. I'm a database guy. So frameworks claim to improve speed of development and abstract the need to know SQL. Who agrees with that? Okay, either you guys don't use frameworks or you don't believe me. That's what frameworks do or claim to do. But the reality is, is that the undocumented cost of the suboptimal performance just won't let you scale the system. So if you don't care about the volume, if you're not a New York Public Library or a, a White House, um, um, some other popular website, um, then that's fine. But if you have a scalability problem, you realize that it doesn't work. And I've worked with a large Drupal site, and I will tell you that the user registration of Drupal 6 plus, plus whatever they were doing, uh, I had a look at the SQL statements. It's a very simple technique. It's just turn on the query log. It's really that simple. Okay, if you've never done it, just try it. Go to uh, the slides, go to this presentation, the software development for my SQL presentation. There's a very detailed section of five or six things developers need to do. There's a little bit of developer bashing too, so. Um, but one of them is like explains how to turn the general query log, how to read the general query log. And I've, I've worked with a customer where I turn on the query log, and lo and behold, there are 50 SQL statements, five zero SQL statements to register a user. Not in a transaction, I might add. Now what was really ironic is, is that they actually only need to execute 13 out of the 50 SQL statements. So my job is already done. I've just eliminated three quarters of your database access uh, for registering users. Um, the reality was they were using Drupal and their sort of node implementation required 13 statements, but if you actually architected the system properly, you need four or five. So another 3x improvement. So we're down to five SQL statements where there were 50. That's 10 times improvement just to register a user. Can you imagine what the rest of the system looks like? If I could find this in the first example of the code. So normally if I see a pattern immediately, I'm pretty confident that it's going to exist everywhere. It's like, if you have 100,000 lines of code, and in the first 1,000 lines of code you find 10 bugs, then you can extrapolate out that you're going to find the same amount of bugs for the rest of the lines of code. Um, unless there's an exception, um, that's generally the case. So um, at that point, I will uh, close up because I think we had a hard stop at 8. What time is it? Oh, well, we'll have a I'm not too late. We'll have a networking session. And, um, uh, Hopefully you will be available for questions after. Yeah, um, you know, all I can say is like, don't single string, let's run in parallel. See, two dogs, parallel. <laughs> um, so thank you, thank you, Sergey, thank you, Grobo, for hosting. Um, I, hope you, I hope you all learn something new. Who here can take something they learn and apply it? Great, I got through to at least one of you. That's all I need to hear. Um, so. Uh, if you have some success, let me know. I always love to get some feedback. Um, and uh, I, I, I have will... a MySQL specific question, but yes. I'll ask later. You come up and see me afterwards, and we'll we'll, we'll close the meeting off. Uh, we'll have some networking. There is a raffle, so whoever hasn't put in their business card uh, or piece of paper with their details on it, they should do it now. Um, and pass it around. I've decided that whoever's coming to the MySQL meetup. Uh, in uh, three weeks, I think it's May 12th, the same date as the web performance, don't go web performance. CDNs, you don't even know, okay? You want to hear about Pocono? You want to get free tickets to go to the... You want to go to free tickets to the conference they're having in Amsterdam in September? Come to my meetup. Um, and then we're going to play a trivial game as to how to get uh, into the raffle.